are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. All writers are prone to becoming so attached to our characters and stories that we struggle to see why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing to full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, shaping stories into masterpieces that can stand the test of time. Editing services are provided for all genres and all age categories. Services range from critiques of the short story through to the line edits of the full-length novel and copy editing for those preparing for publication. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's file for your website, as well as help with those book blurbs and promotional material. We won't abandon you to the masses. We want to celebrate with you and your successes. Black Wolf Editorial Services. Nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services and prices, visit us at blackwolfeditorial.com. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. This is Jenny Earhart with Southern Sisters Radio, and I'm your Southern Sister. In case you didn't know, you can check us out every Sunday at 2 p.m. right here on KLRN. And I'd love to hear from you. Email me at radio at southernsistershome.com. Welcome to Southern Sisters Radio on Faith Talk Atlanta, the show for Southern women and the men who adore them. Join us as we celebrate life from a Southern point of view. Here's your host, author, founder of Southern Sisters Home and true Southern sister, Jenny McCormick Earhart. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Southern Sisters Radio Program, the show for Southern women and the men who adore us. And I say us because I mean me and you and all of the women that we love. We've got men in our life. Either a father, a husband, a boyfriend, certainly sons that love us very much. And that's just one of the things that we celebrate here on this show. In addition to life in the South and Southern food, Southern culture, Southern fashion. We're going to be talking a little bit about that. And uh, just everything else that makes life in the South so wonderful, including wonderful Southern men like you, Marquis. Oh, thank you. (laughs) And that is a sincere flattery. I am not trying to butter you up. (laughs) But we're here today to talk about everything we love about the South. And there's so much to love. You know, I've been thinking this past week about uh, Southern dogs. And it's not the first time I've talked about Southern dogs on this show. You know, Gardening Gun Magazine does a feature every year called um, the Good Dog Contest. Right. Hmm. And what they do is they encourage their their readers, their readership, I should say, to send in photographs of their pets in all kinds of cute different poses. And, uh, of course, everybody gets on board with that contest because we Southerners do love our dogs. Yes, we do. So my oldest daughter got the idea that we should submit our dog, my dog, Dixie. Um, into the uh, into the garden and gun good dog contest, right? Because yeah. she is indeed a good dog, and she's she's quite attractive too, if you ask me. Mm. So anyway, my daughter takes an adorable picture of Dixie, the Australian Shepherd, and she's kind of a golden color, you know. So she's really beautiful. She's actually a mix between gold um, between Australian Shepherd and Blue Heeler. Ooh. Both of those breeds are herding dogs, so she knows how to herd goats and sheep and things like that. Well, instinct, Sheeps. instinctively, right? <laughs> instinctively. You know, the first time I took her to a field, uh, my husband used to own a farm and he had sheep. And uh, he said, you need to bring her over and uh, let's see what, you know, let's see, let's see what she does out in the field. And I'm like, well, you know, this is a suburban indoor dog. <laughs> I said, she has never seen any sort of livestock in her life. And he said, but bring her over. Let's just see. I said, OK. So over we went to the field and let her out of the car and let her into the field and closed the gate behind her. She was in, stuck in this field now with about 10 sheep, all right? Male, female, different colors. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm telling you, that dog transformed herself into the most amazing herding dog. She went after those sheep. She lowered her head, right? She chased them all across the field, nipping at their heels, Ever so lightly. I mean, she didn't bite them, but she nipped at them. You know what Mm -hmm. I'm saying? All in an attempt to get them herded together into one pack. 
right? I don't know if it's called a pack. That's, <laughs> that's wolves that are in a pack. Whatever sheep are, right? A herd, okay? Yeah, a a herd, herd, right? And so she got them all corralled up against the corner of the barn, like in the in a corner right there where they couldn't get out. And those sheep nearly freaked out, you know, because we'd never we'd never you know unleashed a dog on them before. Yeah. So she got them up there and she growled at them, right? And those little sheep were all just you know just shoulder to shoulder, all stuck up against the side <laughs> of the barn. And and I'm telling you, my husband and I just stood there with our mouths hanging open, and I just looked at him and I said. Where on earth did that dog learn how to do that? And he goes, he looked at me and he says, God taught her. Yep. <laughs> so this was an instinctive thing. So anyway, I'm super proud of my my herding dog, Dixie. And I figured, let's submit her her picture into Garden Gun Magazine and see how she does. We thought for sure she'd win because we have a lot of faith in her. You know, and so it turns out me and everybody, me and about 10,000 other people in the South think that their dogs are yeah. the very best in the whole wide world. <laughs> and so we would go on occasionally and check her status, mm-hmm. you know, to see how many people had voted for her. And she was doing pretty well in the beginning. And then she kind of started to slip a little bit. I think I, had, I think there are a lot of people out there with friends. I think they pay them off yep. to call in and vote for their dogs. And so eventually she began slipping in the polls just a little bit. Turns out she was not the only Dixie entered in this poll. Ah. Well, there were thousands of dogs. She was one of about 40, 40 something dogs named Dixie that were entered. So she may not have won, but she, well, she won in my heart, Marky. Oh, she placed. I'm super proud of her. I really am. So anyway, well, I was talking a little bit with my husband this week about our diets and the things that we eat. And it's interesting how Dixie, the subject of our dog, came up because this poor, poor dog has suffered from an allergy for years. It was a bit of a mystery. I didn't know what it was that was causing the problem. She was getting these terrible rashes on her back. They get, they get infected. I'd have to take her to the vet. She'd have to go on an antibiotic. It would clear up. And then about a month or two later, it would come right back. And this went on and on and on. And I'm not a real big proponent of, you know, thinking that dogs necessarily need special diets, expensive diets. But the vet kept saying, you know what? She might have an allergy to something she's eating. Why don't you try a grain free dog food? Mm -hmm. And I, of course, I was thinking, well, this is just another way of getting money out of me (laughs) because conveniently the vet happened to sell that dog food. (laughs) Anyway, so we said, you know what? Let's give it a try. See what happens. So we put her on this grain free dog food and she was on it uh, for probably about a month and a month and a half. And the vet said, just observe her. We're going to give her an antibiotic to clear up the infection. And if it doesn't come back, then that's a pretty good indication that it's the dog food that's helping. She must have an allergy to grain. And sure enough, that is what has happened. She has now been on a grain-free diet for almost eight months and has not had a single rash of any kind, no allergic reactions. So I'm kind of sold on the whole concept that maybe, you know, grains may not always be the best thing for dogs. So you have a gluten-free dog food I for your dog. I have a gluten-free. <laughs> I so do. So your dog is a vegan. <laughs> is that terrible? No, 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 not a, not a vegan. It's, it's all turkey and, and oh, okay. you know. Okay. And interestingly, there's a fun store um, that I go to that has healthy food for dogs. I mean, do you know that you can get, uh, I'm not kidding, I saw it, you can get uh, food for dogs that's made out of alligator Alligator food, yes. Well, you're in in America, so you're in America. You can find anything. Anything. Bison. They have bison. How about that? They have venison. For I your thought dog. bison were extinct. No, they got a few of them out okay, west, I think. Right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, hey, you can get a bison burger at Ted's Montana Grill. Yeah, that's not good. No, those are so delicious, so aren't good. they? Anyway, so my husband and I have decided we're going to try to eat a little healthier. We're not going on diets, but we have been working on eating a cleaner diet. And by definition, what that really means is food that doesn't have as many additives in them. They often say if you want a clean, healthy diet to shop around the perimeter of the grocery store. That's where all the meats and vegetables and all of the healthy things are. And then you tend to have more of your processed foods towards the center Mm. of the grocery store. You see what I'm saying? So anyway, I honestly have been really working on this and we've been doing a pretty good job. So I'm going to kind of give guys some updates as we go along over the next few weeks just to kind of talk about some of the changes we've made and how they're affecting us. And I will tell you the very first change that I've made, and I'm going to try to stick to it, is I've eliminated sugar from my diet. What? Uh, uh, I know. Now, you have to understand who you're talking to. This is a girl who loves sugar in her coffee. I love my desserts. Sweet tea. I love, oh, oh, Mar- Marquis, help me. Nope. Nope. <laughs> I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm dying. Stepping I'm back. dying without my sweet tea. <laughs> I'm giving it a shot to see how it affects me. I will tell you the first initial um, reaction that I had to no sugar for about a day and a half was um, anger. <laughs> <laughs> I got grumpy. And, you know, apparently this is a normal reaction. If you're accustomed to having a good bit of sugar in your diet and you suddenly go cold turkey and you don't have it, you tend to get 
angry. So I would just say I'm, I wouldn't necessarily say angry. I'd say more grumpy. You no, know what okay. I'm saying? I'm not. I haven't been quite as lovable and happy around the house. That's really what it, really what it amounts to. Um, but I'm giving it a shot, and I'm not. I'm finding now I'm not missing it quite as much. I'm adding things like lemon to my tea, mm-hmm. lime to my tea, things like that. I'm also cutting out bread for a little while to see how I do with that. Now that's once again that whole grain free concept. I'm thinking. You know, like dog, like owner. Maybe I, you know, maybe I could benefit from a little less grain in my diet. Maybe your rashes will clear up. I'm kidding. I can't do that <laughs> well, maybe my grumpiness will clear up. Yeah. That would be even better. <laughs> but some of the essential things that I've had uh, around my house, I'm just going to mention a few of them. Is I've been loving keeping uh, like a lot of lean protein and, and vegetables in the house. So I'm I'm keeping hard boiled eggs in the house. I love to just. Uh, hard boil them, peel them, have them ready to go. That way, if you just need a good dose of protein, mm-hmm. you need that shot of food, I can slice one in half, sprinkle it with a little salt and pepper, maybe a little cayenne, mm-hmm. you know, spice it up a bit. I'm keeping lots of fresh lemons and limes around the house for squeezing on salads in my water, um, on grilled fish and meat and things like that. Lots of fresh greens, guys. Variety. I've been playing around with arugula, fresh spinach. Mm. Lord knows those baby field greens. We all love those. Um, And then lots of fresh veggies in the house. I find that if I keep them in the house Mm -hmm. and they're washed and they're cut up and they're in containers, I'm more likely to eat them. You know, how many of us have thrown out that sad little cucumber that we found in the back of the produce (laughs) drawer just because we kind of forgot about it? So wash it up, chop it up, keep it readily available, folks. And you can maybe clean up your diet just a little bit like I am. We'll see how it goes, Marquis. I may not last very long. (laughs) But anyway, guys, we would love to hear from you. We love your input on show ideas and just what's going on in your life here in the South. Feel free to email us at radio at southernsistershome.com. And we'll be right back. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable, everyday carry or a tough-as-nails holster for your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. Is debt beating you down? You need discipline. You need the Debt Ninja. If you've been caught in a financial trap and need to be set free, then you need the Debt Ninja. Want to stop those harassing collection calls? Start saving thousands in interest and fees and get out of debt fast? Then you need to call the Debt Ninja. The Debt Ninja will find the best companies across the country that will help you consolidate all your bills into one easy payment, reduce your payments by 30 to 50%, and get you out of debt fast. If you have unsecured debt of $10,000 or more, such as credit cards, loans, or medical bills, call the Debt Ninja for a free 15-minute consultation. Call 800-826-1246. 800-826-1246. That's 800-826-1246. Call today. The Debt Ninja. Individuals and businesses with tax problems, listen carefully. Do you feel like you're losing control over your finances? If you owe over $10,000 in back taxes or have unfiled tax returns, we can help you take back control. The IRS is the largest and most aggressive collection agency in the world, and they can seize your bank account, garnish your paycheck, close your business, and file criminal charges. Take control of your tax problems now by calling the experts at Tax Mediation Services and take advantage of the Fresh Start program and new laws that may allow us to negotiate a settlement for the lowest amount possible. Our team of tax attorneys and enrolled agents can stop collections and get you protected so you can take control of your financial future. Tax Mediation Services is accredited by the Better Business Bureau. Call now for a free case review and a price protection guaranteed quote. Call Tax Mediation Services now at 800-610-9050. That's 800-610-9050. 
800-610-9050. Hey, KLRN Radio family. This is Jenny Earhart. Check out the Southern Sisters Radio Show every Sunday at 2 p.m. right here on KLRN. Connect with me on Facebook at Southern Sisters Home with Jenny Earhart. You can also catch our Facebook Live videos, unedited and uncensored. Connect with me personally. Email me at radio at southernsistershome.com. We are talking chicken now, and I know that is just a in, just an inspired topic for so many of you out there. Uh, you know, those of you who have not had chicken to eat in the past two days, raise your hand. I hear I hear crickets. Yeah, yeah. There's no. We eat chicken every day, just about. I know at my house we do. It is one of the South's premier culinary uh, staples, really, quite yep. frankly. And we make it lots of different ways. We do. Um, I love chicken. It's low in fat. Well, depending on how you prepare it, right? I do all kinds of fun things with it. Um, but the interesting thing is so many of us are just kind of hooked on these boneless, skinless chicken breasts. Yes. And I got to tell you, without a little tender love and care, these boneless chicken breasts can be a little bit, um, well, shall we say, boring. Dry. Dry, right? So, you know, the thing is with chicken breasts is it's just with a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of fun, maybe a little bit of creativity, you can take boring to fabulous in mm. just a few minutes. It doesn't, it's not hard to do. You know, my son has been uh, really working on staying fit, staying in shape. He's a, he's a sophomore in college. He came home over the summertime and instructed me not to prepare any high fat, high sugar dishes this summer, that he was really focusing on working out and buffing up. And, um, which of course I was delighted to hear that. Uh, I didn't think he needed to, but he that's what he's been doing. And so he, he sent me to the grocery store and, and instructed me to buy chicken and uh, boneless breasts, of course, and then you know spinach and fruit and things for him to make some healthier options. Now, he said, why don't you show me how to how to whip up a good chicken breast? And so he and I and this was so so much fun for me. Um, I put on my little apron and I got in the kitchen with my 19 year old son. And I said, now, have you, have you cooked a chicken breast before? And he said, he says, yeah, I just need to make sure I'm good on the temperature. I said, well, here, let's, let's take out the chicken breast. So we, we took it out and put it on the cutting board. And I said, now, the first thing you want to do is you want to spice it up just a little bit, you know, a little salt and pepper. And I went to grab the salt and the pepper and some of my seasonings. And he was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, no, no. I just like the taste of the chicken. Really? Not even a little salt? Not even a little salt and pepper. And I said, you sure about that? I said, well, I said, tell you what, let's put a little drizzle of olive oil in the pan and we'll go from there, which I did. And then I'm just watching, I'm, I'm pan searing this chicken breast and it's just taken every bit of self-control I have inside me <laughs> <laughs> not to grab for the spices with both hands and start coating this thing, you know, with something. And he, I said, Jack, are you sure? I said, I said, honey, this is going to be a, um, a pretty bland uh, chicken breast. Mm-hmm. He goes, no, I think I'm good with it. I'm good with it. So I, you know, he, it ended up being fine in the end. We did it the next day also. And I said, uh, the second day in, and I said, you know, how about today we try, I've got this really good cilantro lime shaker and it's, it's got a, um, a powder in it. You know, it's like a, a, a spice season. He finally let me put a little bit of that on there and I think he liked it. So, um, uh, but guys, basically what the, what the goal is, I guess, when you're making ch- boneless chicken breasts is simply not to make it boring. Yep. You know, take it from boring to, to delicious. And I got a couple of great ideas for you. And we're going to talk about a few ways to take those simple, humble, uh, boneless, skinless chicken breasts and create them into something fabulous for our families. I'm going to start with one that I think my son would love. I'm actually going to going to work with him on this and putting this one together very soon. And it's very simple. It's a honey mustard breaded chicken recipe. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk you through it. Folks, your kids are going to love this dish. And it is so simple. All you're going to need is about four boneless, skinless chicken breast halves. Okay. About four ounces each. One cup of dry breadcrumbs. One teaspoon plus two tablespoons Dijon mustard. You're going to divide that. Right. Three tablespoons of honey. And two tablespoons of butter. That's all there is to it. What is that, Marky? One, two, three, four, five ingredients. Mm -hmm. You want to flatten your chicken to about one quarter inch thickness. Now, this is a great technique. I do this all the time. If you've ever looked at a chicken breast, you see it's a little fatter on one end and a little shorter on the other. That can sometimes uh, mean you've got some inconsistent cooking going on. The shorter end's going to get dried out quicker, right? And it's so much nicer when you can kind of have a nice flat, consistent surface. So I like to hammer mine out, okay? So I use a meat mallet, all right? I lay a piece of plastic wrap over the chicken breast on the cutting board, Mm -hmm. and then I just uh, start pounding away, okay? Flat side or the uh, spike side? I use the flat side, because otherwise that chicken's going to tear up an awful lot. You know what I'm saying? Um, I use the flat side. I flatten it down to about a a one-quarter inch thickness. Um, It's a great technique for also getting any, uh, you know, pent-up frustrations that you might have (laughs) going on in your life. 
Okay, so it's chicken and therapy at the same time. You understand? Anyway, so you flatten the chicken out, and then in a small bowl, you're going to combine your breadcrumbs. You want this to be shallow so that you can dip the chicken in. Uh, breadcrumbs, uh, you want to combine that with one teaspoon of the mustard, right? And then in a separate bowl, another shallow bowl, you're going to combine your honey and the rest of the mustard. It is so simple, folks. You dip the chicken in the honey mustard mixture first, then into the breadcrumbs, coat it good on both sides, and then it's going to go into a nonstick skillet. You're going to cook it over medium heat in the melted butter, all right, for about four to six minutes on each side. You want to make sure those juices run clear, right? Yep. We don't want any of our listeners getting salmonella. No. Right? Make sure the juices run clear. You're going to have four servings. Your kids are going to love you. Love you. Is that not simple? That's simple. And it's so much better than just a <laughs> plain, plain sauteed That's chicken That's what you sound like. You just got to make I what you sound like. I know. I know I do. How about another idea, guys, for those lowly chicken breasts? How about some balsamic chicken with roasted tomatoes? Mm. Now, this is easy. Mm. Yes. You're such an appreciative culinary listener, I love, I love food. The sound effects just, I'm like, yeah. I eat right? food. I love food. I know, right? Three times a day we have to eat. Sometimes more, yeah, in my some, case. Yeah, me too. <laughs> All right, this one, this one is not difficult, guys. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to preheat your oven to 425 degrees. Got that? You're going to need two tablespoons of honey, two tablespoons of olive oil divided in half, two cups of grape tomatoes. Now, I made a little notation here, or more. I like lots of grape tomatoes. You know what I'm saying? I can eat a ton of them. So if you want to double that or triple that, go right ahead. This is going to make four servings. So you want four boneless, skinless chicken breasts. I have a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper, and some balsamic glaze. And I've talked about balsamic glaze on the, on the show before. Mm-hmm. Basically, what I do is I put my balsamic vinegar into a saucepan, and I just simmer it and simmer it and simmer it. It takes a little while. We're going to bring it to a boil then and reduce it down. All right? It's going to get thicker and more syrupy as you do that. Do you reduce it by half? By about half. About and it depends on how, how thick you want it. Mm-hmm. I then take it and put it in a little squeeze bottle. Can I give the listeners a little tip here? Please, Varmiki. When you're reducing your balsamic vinegar in your pan, just look for the little line around the pan. Yeah. Then you'll know when it's reducing because you see that little line and you'll see your liquid below it. I know. You're right, mm-hmm. right? People are sometimes like, what? What yep. do you mean reduce? How, how do I know when I've got the right amount? Good tip there. So anyway, what you're going to do is in a small bowl, you're going to mix the honey and one tablespoon of the oil. You're going to add your lovely little grape tomatoes, and you're going to toss them to coat, uh, to coat them well with that mixture. Then you're going to transfer your tomatoes onto a uh, a baking sheet. All right, you're going to either spray it with some uh, some spray of some kind, uh, grease it in some way because you don't want those those tomatoes to stick because they mm-hmm. will because they're going to start to kind of get a little crispy around the edges. And they're going to caramelize a little bit, and you don't want them to stick. You're going to bake them in the oven for about twelve to fourteen minutes. Now. A lot of this is personal preference, Marky. If you like them just kind of soft and mushy, fine. If you want them really sort of roasted down, you know, I, to me, the flavors just get more intense the more that you roast them. Yep. So easy. All right. So you're going to do that until they're softened and reduced down. You're going to take those out of the oven and set them aside. Now, you're going to pound your chicken breast with a meat mallet again. We want to reduce it down to about a half an inch thick this time. Sprinkle it generously with salt and pepper, right? And then in a large skillet, you're going to heat the remaining oil, right, the tablespoon of oil, over medium heat. You're going to add your chicken breasts, cook them again for about five to six minutes on each side until they're no longer pink. Then what I like to do is take these lovely chicken breasts and arrange them on a platter and spoon Mm. all of those wonderful tomatoes over the top of the chicken, and, you know, Marky, we've talked about how Southern women always like to make it pretty. Yes. Right? So I would also then maybe sprinkle a little chopped parsley over the top. It just makes it beautiful and colorful. Or, quite frankly, if you've got some basil in the garden like I do, <laughs> little chopped basil. I knew the garden was coming up. So. The garden is coming up. He's got to. I, I'm still trying to go through all of the all that I have in there. It's incredible. Okay. How about a little saucy garlic chicken recipe? Now, this one is just delightful. And just, well, saucy. Well, I'm getting hungry. (laughs) In the best possible way. You're going to love this, guys. And you're going to utilize some roasted garlic. And I'm going to tell you how to do that. What you're going to need is four bulbs of garlic. Now, that's a lot of garlic, Marky. That's a lot. You're going to remove the paper, the papery outer skin from the garlic bulbs, right? Don't peel it or separate the cloves. You're going to cut off the tops of the garlic cloves. uh, Did I say cloves? You did say cloves. (laughs) Cut off the top of the garlic bulbs. And you're going to brush the bulbs with about a tablespoon of oil. Wrap each one in heavy-do aluminum foil. And then roast them in the oven at 425 for about 30 minutes until they're nice and softened. Take them out and let them cool. 
Meanwhile, you're going to take a, a baking dish, a 13 by 9. You're going to place n- 9 ounces of uh, fresh spinach. So you can get a 9-ounce package of fresh spinach. Lay that in the bottom, okay? Then what you're going to do is you are going to sprinkle it with a little salt and pepper. And then in a large skillet, you're going to brown your chicken breasts in oil, about one tablespoon. You're going to brown both sides of the chicken breasts, right, until they're nice and browned on the outside. Then you're going to lay your chicken over your spinach in the baking dish. Got it? Easy so far, right, Marquise? This is not complicated. Now, in a large saucepan, you're going to melt six tablespoons of butter. You're then going to whisk in six tablespoons of flour until smooth. And gradually add three cups of milk. You can use 2% or whole, whatever your preference is. You want to bring it all to a boil, guys. You want to cook and stir it for about one to two minutes or until it's thickened. Got it? You're going to stir in two cups of Parmesan cheese, a little nutmeg, and some salt and pepper. Believe it or not, folks, here's the fun part. You're going to transfer it to a blender. Yes, I said a blender. You are then going to squeeze all of that softened garlic Mm -hmm. into the blender. You're going to cover it and process it until smooth. You're then going to pour this wonderful garlicky mixture right over the top of your chicken, garnish it with a little pepper and maybe a little tomatoes and some fresh basil, and call it a day. There you go, guys. Lots of new ways to enjoy those homely little chicken breasts. We'll be right back. prone to becoming so attached to our characters and stories that we struggle to see why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing into full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, shaping stories into masterpieces that can stand the test of time. Editing services are provided for all genres and all age categories. Services range from critiques of the short story through to the line edits of the full-length novel and copy editing for those preparing for publication. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's file for your website, as well as help with those book blurbs and promotional material. We won't abandon you to the masses. We want to celebrate with you and your successes. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services and prices, Visit us at blackwolfeditorial.com. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Is debt beating you down? You need discipline. You need the Debt Ninja. If you've been caught in a financial trap and need to be set free, then you need the Debt Ninja. Want to stop those harassing collection calls? Start saving thousands in interest and fees and get out of debt fast? Then you need to call the Debt Ninja. The Debt Ninja will find the best companies across the country that will help you consolidate all your bills into one easy payment, reduce your payments by 30 to 50 percent, and get you out of debt fast. If you have unsecured debt of $10,000 or more, such as credit cards, loans, or medical bills, call the Debt Ninja for a free 15-minute consultation. Call 800-826-1246. 800-826-1246. That's 800-826-1246. Call today. The Debt Ninja. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable, everyday carry or a tough-as-nails holster for your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. Individuals and businesses with tax problems, listen carefully. Do you feel like you're losing control over your finances? If you owe over $10,000 in back taxes or have unfiled tax returns, we can help you take back control. The IRS is the largest and most aggressive collection agency in the world, and they can seize your bank account, garnish your paycheck, close your business, and file criminal charges. Take control of your tax problems now by calling the experts at Tax Mediation Services and take advantage of the Fresh Start program and new laws that make 
may allow us to negotiate a settlement for the lowest amount possible. Our team of tax attorneys and enrolled agents can stop collections and get you protected so you can take control of your financial future. Tax Mediation Services is accredited by the Better Business Bureau. Call now for a free case review and a price protection guaranteed quote. Call Tax Mediation Services now at 800-610-9050. That's 800-610-9050. 800-610-9050. This is Jenny Earhart with Southern Sisters Radio, and I'm your Southern Sister. In case you didn't know, you can check us out every Sunday at 2 p.m. right here on KLRN. And I'd love to hear from you. Email me at radio at southernsistershome.com. Hey, and welcome back to the Southern Sisters Radio program. We are reflecting on the past during this segment. We are, Marquis. We're, talk- we're talking about things that we remember from the past, maybe some things that used to be kind of uh, very characteristic of life in the South or life across the country, quite frankly. Specifically, we're looking at what I call old school. Ooh, old school. Old school. You have any idea what I might be talking about? Um, mm. No. Hmm. Britney Spears, I'll 2000? Fill you in. I don't know. <laughs> you are such a funny I'm man. I'm a millennial. You know, I don't, that's, I, that's old to you, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. You know, I'm a millennial. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> You're not allowed to talk anymore. Is it pre-Facebook or, you know, MySpace is old oh, school. I don't no, know. I know. Well, I will be honest with you. Reading reading through some of these uh, concepts of old school and things that we used to do in our schools, it really is. It, it made me feel a little bit old. It did. A little bit. A little bit old. Um, but then again, it also made me reflect on some of the things that we have kind of let go of mm. that maybe we should have hang on, hung on to. You know, there's a few things we used to do in schools that, that, believe me, modern day schools do not do anymore. So I thought we'd run through some of them. And, and folks, for those of you uh, that are following along with us here, you know, we'd love to hear your feedback on this. Memories that you have of things that you used to do in school that we don't do anymore, right? For, for whatever reason. It could be they're not politically correct. No. It could be that things we used to do have now been pr- replaced with other things you know, that involve more modern technology. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But it's always fun to reminisce. I love to reminisce. And we're going to start off. We're going to start off today talking about some things that we used to do in school that was common that we don't do anymore. Number one of them, number one, and, and, and something that I used to do in high school, I was kind of surprised to see this on the list, Marquis. Oh, okay, let's see. I was well, a little disappointed. Well, what is it? Well, learning baton twirling. Okay, now, I, I think there are still some majorettes out there in, yeah. in marching bands, aren't there? There are. Well, apparently, there used to be a lot more, and it was far more common, and a lot of schools have done away with this. You know what I'm saying? Now, I was a majorette in oh. high school. Yes, I had the little sequined uniform. I worked <laughs> very hard learning to tw- twirl the baton, um, and to me, it was just it was a great activity. I loved hanging out with my majorette friends, but this is apparently not something that's really done so much anymore. Not that I'm aware of. No, it's kind of an art form. They they refer to it as an art form. Um, and interestingly now, I think it may have to do with the fact that there are so many other great sports options for women these mm-hmm. days that they didn't used to have. You know, yeah. maybe there weren't as many choices. Um, and so now, I guess, baton twirling has to compete with all of the other, you know, just the plethora of girl sports that are out there. Well, you, I, you still have the, um, what are they called, uh, the, the, the ones the, who are the, out there with the band? Yeah, the, the drill team? Yeah, the drill team. Yeah, those are awesome. Yeah, they are. Yeah, I love that too. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, it's something to think of. You know, the highlight of my baton twirling career in high school uh, was twirling a fire baton. Whoa. Oh, yeah. We used to soak those things in some kind of gas. I think it was kerosene during a pep rally or a game during a, a football game oh. they don't they dim the lights you know what i'm saying they turn mm-hmm. down the lights and we come out with our fire batons oh yeah now I, you know i don't know that they do that anymore when i think of the liability involved <laughs> i remember i used to singe the hair on my arms i could just i guess hear the announcement right now. and now coming to the football field is jenny mccormick and the fire twirlers and the fire twirlers <laughs> you know it's a miracle that we all as much aquanet hairspray as we put on our hair it is a miracle that we did not set our heads on fire. And this had to be, what, the late 80s and your hair's all You're sprung up? Me. Yeah, yeah. I'm Big dating hair. you the late 80s? Come mm-hmm. on now. Okay, yeah. What, you was like 15? Yeah, and- there you go, Marquis. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you for that. Okay, so baton twirling. Here it came and there it went. We don't see as much of it anymore. How about morning prayer? <sighs> morning prayer, right? Doesn't happen in school anymore. No, and this was something that I had great memories of doing. Um, even in the public schools, they would have morning prayer. Mm-hmm. Now, eventually, as time went by, that kind of went away. But, you know, those that attended Christian schools or Catholic schools will still, you know, 
continued that process, probably even to this day, yeah. I would imagine. But it was something that was very common was to open the day with prayer, either one led by the principal over mm-hmm. the intercom or one led by the maybe your homeroom teacher. Right. But, but morning prayer has kind of gone away. That's one that I kind of wish was still around, although it does beg the question these days, who would be writing the prayer? Exactly. You know, it, that, that's a kind or of a how low. many prayers would be said. Exactly. Because every single different, mm-hmm. you know, religion would need to be representative. How about learning cursive handwriting? Yes. Oh. I hated it. You hated it? I'm a boy. Okay. Right. Boys don't tend to like cursive. No. No. I, I'm, I'm sorry I had to reiterate that I'm a boy on the radio if you hear my voice. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, he is my female sidekick with yes. a very, very deep voice. That's all, folks. Well, hello, the radio <laughs> listeners. <laughs> she's, she's identifying female. No, no, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. No, no. You understand. Boys do have, a, I think, a little bit more of a struggle. I don't mm-hmm. know if it's a dexterity thing, fine motor skills, maybe. That, that's that paying attention thing. I, Boys, we just want to run through it. Let's just yeah. write it. Like even nowadays, I write my name like with big letters and small letters yeah. like I'm a four-year-old. Do you really? Yes. Yeah. It's less important nowadays. And I guess one of the reasons, folks, that they're not really including cursive handwriting in the schools is because it's been replaced with a uh, keyboard typing. Mm-hmm. Everything's online. Everything's digital. Right. Uh, you know, there's no uh, no pulling out a paper and pencil and writing long letters anymore. We just shoot emails. Well, I was surprised that my fourth grader is learning cursive this year. <gasps> really? Yes. It's a beautiful art, I will say. It, it really is. You know, and when you have to write a thank you note, it's so nice to be able to do it in, in cursive handwriting. I'll just send an email. Oh, well, geez, I'm a millennial. You you're a modern, you're a modern <laughs> Southern man, Marky. <laughs> you know what else has gone away, Marky? This that? makes me kind of sad in a way, I guess. Um, although I did get pummeled in the face by a ball the, a few times. Um, dodgeball. The ultimate male sport. Dodgeball. Dodgeball. <laughs> <laughs> now, it. inevitably, I, I don't think I ever participated in a dodgeball game where someone didn't end up crying. Somebody, Me either. <laughs> somebody got, you know what I'm saying? Somebody got hit in the face, you know, slammed right in the nose. And as a man, you the, the boys always picked one person we were going to all try to hit with the ball. Oh, yeah. Every oh, yeah. single game. Every single game. You know, and it's in a way to get revenge on people you didn't like. <laughs> I guess we can kind of see why it went away. Yes. In this politically incorrect world, or politically correct, <laughs> I should. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In this world, uh, dodgeball just had no chance. But you know what? You can still play it on your own. We still play it at uh, church retreats when we go. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. How about another thing that they don't do anymore? Writing on the chalkboard when you got in trouble. You know, like, I will not copy off my neighbor's paper or I will not speak out of turn. And you'd have to write it a hundred times on the chalkboard. And it was rather humiliating. Now, I, you know I'm not speaking from personal experience. Oh, you're not? Oh, no. N- nothing such well, like that I ever will. happened to me. <laughs> I will speak from personal experience. Remember, I grew up in deep South Georgia. We still had a lot of the old archaic technology. Yeah. So, yes, I've written on the chalkboard plenty of times, and I have dusted the the eraser plenty of times. Plenty of times. (laughs) A lot of classrooms don't even have chalkboards anymore. Well, nowadays they have these new little cool digital touchscreen things. Really? Yeah. Interesting. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. It is. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, so writing on the chalkboard, I guess that's a, also a form of public humiliation yeah. if you're having to do it during class time. Right. Mm-hmm. How about do you remember this? Did you ever get the weekly reader? It, it was a little it was it was a little publication that was produced. It, it just went away in 2012. But I remember it uh, as a child. It was a little publication that came out every month. It was called the weekly reader. And it was really kind of integrated into our curriculum. They had little stories and also a little synopsis of new children's book titles that you could um, that you could read. I loved getting the weekly reader every month from Scholastics. I think so. Yes, I remember those. Yeah. A I little, remember those. It, like a little folding newspaper. Yep. Yeah. It was it was wonderful. You know what else we don't see as much of, Marquis, are the brown bag lunches, the brown paper bag. Everyone wants a superhero on their I lunchbox know. nowadays. Mm-hmm. Now, I admit, I did have a David Cassidy lunchbox. <laughs> it was a great source of pride for me, I will say. He was so cute. I, I knew that one day I was going to grow up and he was going to discover me. If I took a lunch to school, it was in a Kroger bag. <laughs> <laughs> Kroger bag. <laughs> do you know, um, I had an opportunity to pack lunch for my son not too long ago. I had to do it while he was doing an internship. And I said, I'll pack your lunch for you. Just a little thing I could do for him. And I ran out of lunch bags. Mm-hmm. And so for like a week, I was just putting his lunch literally in whatever empty bags I could find around the house, like <laughs> empty like bread bags, yep. you know, or one had dinner rolls in it from the night before and still had the price tag on the bag. <laughs> I told him, I said, put this in your backpack. Don't let anybody see that I'm putting your lunch in this. It's embarrassing. How about 
Uh, school book covers. Did you ever wrap yours in brown paper yes. bags? Yes, and then we would draw all over it, and we have yeah. our friends sign the back and stuff yeah. like that. We had our own little messages and mementos on it. Yeah. yeah. It was a form of your personal expression. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? They don't really do that so much anymore either, right? How about learning to tell time on an analog clock? Well, me being a military man, I had to. You had to do that. (laughs) You did. I know. I remember when I homeschooled my children for a time, we had a big clock and it had the little arms and, you know, arms on it and the... And uh, and I would I would quiz them on it. I would just you know, I make them close their eyes and I'd spin the spin the little arms around mm-hmm. and open your eyes. What time is it? You know. <laughs> and so I did teach mine. Um, but I don't know if that's so much taught in in schools. I don't think so either anymore. We have digital everything. Do you remember checking out books from the library and the librarian would use a little stamp to stamp the date that it was due in the back of the book? Yes. You recall that? Yes. Right. Then we had to sign our name beside it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you had to put your little name down. I remember it was fun to look at the card and see who else had yes, checked it out before yes. me, right? And every now and then you'd have the book that like nobody ever wanted to check mm-hmm. out, right? And then there were some that were more popular and everybody wanted to check it out. Yeah, I loved that. Anyway, don't see that so much anymore, do we? Nope. No, and you know what? With my Kindle app, I don't need it. Well, thank you. I downloads. Thank you for ruining the library system. I know I did it. It's all my fault. And along with the library system went something else you may remember, Mark. I'm not sure if you're old enough. Mm. The card catalog. Oh, I used to love the card catalog. You did? Yeah, because I used to always get it and mix it up. I was oh. a really terrible student. Oh, <laughs> no wonder you were writing on the chalkboard, yeah. <laughs> Marky. Bad boy. Oh, yeah, I used to do it all the time. You would mix it up, and I those poor librarians would have to straighten it all out. Yeah. <laughs> that is wrong. <laughs> that is so bad. Oh, bless your little heart. <laughs> but, yeah, how about all those things? You know, i just been thinking so much about all these different uh, just sort of things from the past, you know, uh, any others that you can think of? You know, I was I was thinking last week that just even um, things like um, we used to have school bus monitors. Do they do that anymore? No, I, I was a school bus monitor. I was also a hall monitor. OK, right. Yeah. Do they have do they even have hall monitors? I don't think so. I, I think they've got seen none of my security son's cameras now, That's it. you know, and on lockdown, my daughter in law, who is teaching uh, public elementary school in Meridian, Mississippi, Mm -hmm. told me or told all of us, the family, actually, collectively, that um, in her in her new school, um, the door to the classroom stays locked. Right. Mm -hmm. The main door to the school, the outside doors to the school stay locked. And there is a security guard that comes by and checks on her classroom uh, two or three times during the school day. Wow. You know, so times have, times have changed times a have little changed. bit, haven't they? Yeah. You know, and that's it for this segment, guys. We'll be back in just a few minutes. All writers are prone to becoming so attached to our characters and stories that we struggle to see why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing to full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, shaping stories into masterpieces that can stand the test of time. Editing services are provided for all genres and all age categories. Services range from critiques of the short story through to the line edits of the full-length novel and copy editing for those preparing for publication. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's file for your website, as well as help with those book blurbs and promotional material. We won't abandon you to the masses. We want to celebrate with you and your successes. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services and prices, visit us at blackwolfeditorial.com. Is debt beating you down? You need discipline. You need the Debt Ninja. If you've been caught in a financial trap and need to be set free, then you need the Debt Ninja. Want to stop those harassing collection calls? Start saving thousands in interest and fees and get out of debt fast? Then you need to call the Debt Ninja. The Debt Ninja will find the best companies across the country that will help you consolidate all your bills into one easy payment. Reduce your payments by 30 to 50% and get you out of debt fast. If you have unsecured debt of $10,000 or more, such as credit cards, loans, or medical bills, call the Debt Ninja for a free 15-minute consultation. Call 800-826-1246. 800-826-1246. That's 800-826-1246. Call today. The Debt Ninja. 
Hey, KLRN Radio family, this is Jenny Earhart. Check out the Southern Sisters Radio Show every Sunday at 2 p.m. right here on KLRN. Connect with me on Facebook at Southern Sisters Home with Jenny Earhart. You can also catch our Facebook Live videos, unedited and uncensored. Connect with me personally. Email me at radio at southernsistershome.com. Welcome back to the Southern Sisters Radio Show. Now, with your Southern narrative, sharing stories from around the South, here is your host, Jenny McCormick Earhart. The Godmother of Southern Cooking with Gas by Anne Byrne. My fascination with Mrs. S.R. Dull began on May 15, 1978, the day I arrived at the Atlanta Journal on Marietta Street as the new food writer. Everyone knew of Mrs. Dull but me. I was young and fresh, right out of the University of Georgia, raised in Tennessee to a mother who didn't use cookbooks or pay much attention to what other people were cooking. And it's probably a good thing I didn't know I was following the famous newspaper food writers Mrs. Dole or Grace Hartley when I walked out of the elevator onto the sixth floor newsroom. I was 22 years old and had fried chicken only once with my mother's help. Mrs. Dull not only fried chicken with ease, but she also told the world about it and all our other Southern recipes in her 1928 landmark book called Southern Cooking, the intimate and instructional cookbook that defined what Southern food was. Once I left the newspaper in 1993, Mrs. Dull's cookbook, in which I had gently scribbled suggestions and additions to her classic recipes, like Japanese fruitcake, Lane Cake and Angel Food Cake came with me. It has been a longtime friend, a steady counsel, a point of reference, and remains on my Nashville bookshelf to this day. White Gloves and Aspic Mary Frances Woodside sits on the sofa of her quiet Atlanta townhouse. At age 95, Mary Frances reflects on her famous grandmother as if it were yesterday when Sis Henny, her nickname, was teaching her how to crochet a dress. Or when they were in Sis Henny's experimental kitchen making dogwood petals out of icing and frying flour-dredged chicken in an iron skillet, timing it to cook 30 minutes on each side. And when her grandmother's book, Southern Cooking was first published in 1928 and Mary Frances was seven years old. A fudge recipe in that book was named after her. Years have passed and generations have come and gone, but what remains with Mary Frances are fresh, uncluttered memories of her grandmother, Henrietta Stanley Dull, a.k.a. Mrs. S.R. Dull, the Atlanta newspaper food columnist, author, Southern cooking teacher, and celebrity. Mary Frances, one of seven grandchildren, is now the keeper of the treasures of Henrietta's life, from photos with Walt Disney to handwritten notes attached with straight pens to the first edition pages of Southern Cooking. Open a scrapbook and Mary Frances dials back time, telling stories of white gloves, tomato aspic, and Atlanta debutante parties, of Sis Henny's Japanese fruitcake on the sideboard at Christmas, of crisp corn pone at supper, and of war rationing, wringing a chicken's neck, beating egg whites by hand for angel food cake, and the knowledge that before Sis Henny was famous, she sold food to the ladies at First Baptist Church to support her family. Gas Ovens and Husbands In the early 1900s in Atlanta and other big cities around the South, gas ranges came to the rescue of cooks who were weary from the sooty drudgery of coal and wood-fired stoves. The sleek, clean, enameled surfaces and graceful legs of these new gas ranges brought a change to kitchen design as well as recipes. And compared to the behemoth wood-fired stoves, the smaller, faster-to-heat gas ranges fit well into new bungalow homes. But gas was a misunderstood fuel. While it was popular in England, it took a little getting used to in America, especially in the South. When gas first came out, says Mary Frances, women were afraid of it. Early gas ranges came without pilot lights, 
you lit them with a match or a long rolled up piece of newspaper. And if you accidentally left the gas on after cooking, the gas could fill the oven and the kitchen, and the slightest spark, even from turning on a room light, might cause an explosion. The ranges got safer, of course, with electronic ignition on burners and concealed pilot lights, but fear remained. Atlanta Gaslight, a company founded to fuel the city's street lights and make Atlanta a safer place to travel at night, had a public relations challenge on its hand with the new gas stoves in 1910. The gas company's bulletins advised salespeople how to overcome the superstitious customer. No one was really comfortable cooking with gas until Mrs. Dahl, a caterer and cooking teacher, went into homes and baked angel food cakes and all the southern delicacies using gas heat. A cook stove is like a new husband, Mrs. Dull told the young ladies. You have to live with it and learn to get the best out of it. The voice of reason, a quiet and stern assurance, Mrs. Dull was the South's fanny farmer. And the gas company gave her a new stove for years and years, Mary Frances adds with a smile. I got her used ovens after I got married. Sandwiches and fruitcakes. Henrietta Celeste Stanley was born in the 19th century on December 7, 1863, during the Civil War. She was one of five daughters and three sons and raised at a time when eggs were freshly laid, cornmeal was milled locally, and you killed and cleaned the chicken before you fried it. Her home was Stanley's Mill, a plantation in the northernmost part of Lawrence County, Georgia, near Brunswick, according to local historian Scott Thompson. Her father's family, the Stanleys, were fourth-generation millers originally from the St. James area in Virginia. Young Henrietta spent a lot of time in the kitchen, fascinated with cooking. But with the slow economic recovery in the South after the war, Henrietta's father moved the family north to the Atlanta area so he could work for the railroad. There, in 1886, Henrietta met and married Samuel Rice Dole, a Virginia widower and father of one daughter, says Mary Frances. The Dolls would have five children of their own. Sam worked for Southern Railway. All was well until he suffered a nervous breakdown. He stayed in bed. He couldn't go to work, Mary Frances recalls, staring out the front window. My grandmother was forced with this dilemma of supporting her family, so she went to her church, First Baptist, at the corner of Fifth and Peachtree, where she was a charter member, and told them she would make cakes and sell them to the members. She made sandwiches, and one thing led to another, and she had a catering business on her hands. She was known for her cakes, her cheese straws, and her tomato aspic. When Grace Hartley, who succeeded Mrs. Dull at the Atlanta Journal Food Editor, interviewed her in 1961, Mrs. Dull reflected on the hard time that her life had had, and she, she said that the only one thing she knew how to do as a young mother was cook. It was common for women to prepare their own fruitcake batter and take it to a bakery to have it baked. So Mrs. Dull offered to make the fruitcake batter for the church women. Soon, church folks and neighbors were asking for other cookery services and more information about good food, and she found herself in the cooking school business, writes Grace Hartley. She kept no record of the number of schools she held in the South, but they added up to the hundreds, and whenever she went, she always demonstrated before a packed house. Baking powder and gas stoves. After the turn of the 20th century, better home appliances, new ingredients like baking powder and bleached flour, as well as an interest in science and nutrition, contributed to a change in the way food was prepared. These new tastes in food offered cooking schools in Philadelphia and Boston an opportunity to teach women how to cook and turn this skill into a profession, or for the wealthy to manage a household staff. In the South, there were no cooking schools of the scale, but smaller cooking schools and programs were offered by gas utilities, newspapers and food companies to expose the home cook to new ideas and ingredients. Impressed with her celebrity and her knowledge of cooking, Atlanta Gaslight hired Mrs. Dull to coax Southern women into cooking with gas. Henrietta's husband died in 1919, and one year later, Mrs. Dull approached the Atlanta Journal asking to write a cooking column offering advice to new cooks. It was called Mrs. Dull's Cooking Lessons, and that column lasted 20 years. Her experimental kitchen, where all recipes were tested, was on Cumberland Road in northeast Atlanta's Morningside neighborhood and Mary Frances remembers that the kitchen was never remodeled. She recalls that her grandmother struggled with writing in the beginning, so the newspaper teamed her up with a younger writer, 
specifically one Margaret Mitchell, for some help. The ladies became friends and were members of the Atlanta Quota Club for authors. Simple Dinners and Home Economics Just as Fanny Farmer and other teachers in the North were standardizing cup size measurements, Mrs. Dole taught the South how to measure, says Mary Frances. But in her own way, she defined oven temperature as slow, moderate, or hot, so that cooks with all types of ovens, not just those with the fancy new thermostats, might cook along with her. She alternated efficient teaspoons and tablespoon sizes with colloquialisms like butter the size of an egg. Her recipes excluded no one, and the public loved her. Food companies like White Lily and Marita Bread took notice and paid her to endorse their products. The Georgia Department of Agriculture sent her to New York and paid all of her expenses for creating peanut and sweet potato recipes, Mary Frances adds. A lot of people knew who she was, and her family couldn't have been prouder. Mary Frances shows the photo of Walt Disney and tells how famous New York milliner G. Howard Hodge sent Henrietta a new hat each season for free. She and Mr. Rich of Rich's Department Store were good friends. A Southern Girl For today's cook, turning the pages of Southern cooking is a wonderful throwback to how the South used to cook without shortcuts. And Mrs. Dull isn't short on giving out advice. Here are some of her thoughts about the kitchen. The woman is the heart of the home, and the kitchen is the heart of the house. A kitchen medium size is best because it is more easily kept, less steps being required to do the necessary work, thus saving the woman time, which may be used for recreation. The sink should be under the window. A stool to sit on when preparing food is a great help and saves tired feet and nerves. Mrs. Dull retired from writing in 1938. She spent time with family and enjoyed gardening and sewing in her later years. She died at 100 in 1964 and is buried at Westview Cemetery in Atlanta. Known to brides for her legendary tomato aspic, a whiz at creating baked Alaska for her grandchildren, Sis Henny was all the grandmother a little girl could wish for, and more. Quite a life and a legacy for a Southern girl from the white columns of Lawrence County, who had six children, a sick husband, and all she knew how to do was cook. Individuals and businesses with tax problems, listen carefully. Do you feel like you're losing control over your finances? If you owe over $10,000 in back taxes or have unfiled tax returns, we can help you take back control. The IRS is the largest and most aggressive collection agency in the world, and they can seize your bank account, garnish your paycheck, close your business, and file criminal charges. Take control of your tax problems now by calling the experts at Tax Mediation Services and take advantage of the Fresh Start program and new laws that may allow us to negotiate a settlement for the lowest amount possible. Our team of tax attorneys and enrolled agents can stop collections and get you protected so you can take control of your financial future. Tax Mediation Services is accredited by the Better Business Bureau. Call now for a free case review and a price protection guaranteed quote. Call Tax Mediation Services now at 800-610-9050. That's 800-610-9050. 800-610-9050. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable, everyday carry or a tough-as-nails holster for your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. Is debt beating you down? You need discipline. You need the Debt Ninja. If you've been caught in a financial trap and need to be set free, then you need the Debt Ninja. Want to stop those harassing collection calls? Start saving thousands in interest and fees and get out of debt fast? Then you need to call the Debt Ninja. The Debt Ninja will find the best companies across the country that will help you consolidate all your bills into one easy payment, reduce your payments by 30 to 50%, and get you out of debt fast. If you have unsecured debt of $10,000 or more, such as credit cards, loans, or medical bills, call the Debt Ninja for a free 15-minute consultation. Call 800-826-1246. 
800-826-1246. That's 800-826-1246. Call today. The Debt Ninja. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network. Internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. Hey, KLRN Radio family, this is Jenny Earhart. Check out the Southern Sisters Radio Show every Sunday at 2 p.m. right here on KLRN. Connect with me on Facebook at Southern Sisters Home with Jenny Earhart. You can also catch our Facebook Live videos, unedited and uncensored. Connect with me personally. Email me at radio at southernsistershome.com. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. 